I should tell you, he is really fun over dinner, aren't you? You're fun over dinner. He's fun over dinner. He's fun everywhere. I want to take you back to a time before politics. I want to take you to a time before there is a polis, a city-state in ancient Greece. I want to take you back to the Bronze Age, and I want to offer you my wild idea to finish tonight off. And my wild idea for you is this. I don't think that monsters are always what we think they are. Sometimes I think heroes are monsters, and monsters are heroes. And this is what I'm going to offer you, given that I've only got a tiny bit of time to talk about something which I could literally spend the rest of today talking to you about, even as you were crying and wishing I would stop. Um, it doesn't happen at every gig, just a few. Um, so here's my point. Before there are Gorgons, perhaps the most iconic image of a monster in ancient Greek mythology, with the snaky hair and the ability to turn you to stone with a single glance, before there are whole Gorgons, there are Gorgon heads. Gorgonea is what they're called in Greek. And they appear in art across the Greek world. And by art, I don't mean things in a rarefied gallery. Those don't exist yet. I mean on the outside of people's houses, next to their doors, on the sides of temples, they are used as antifixes, the thing that you put at the end of a pipe. Right? So of course you could argue that these heads are meant to be monsters. I guess I might ask the question, what is that one trying to scare? Maybe a pigeon? But I'm going to just suggest to you that gorgons have a dual function in Greek myth. They're meant to be both scary and protective. They're meant to look after you. And they are to do with the wild world in a way which I don't think we always necessarily realize. So here's the thing. If you look at a gorgon head, and the earlier they are, the more strange and animalistic they are. The earliest ones almost always have snakes for hair, right? That's the thing we associate with Medusa, the most famous of the Gorgons, although there are three. It's another way that we turn her into a monster, is to remove her from her context. It's to make her a single monster living in a cave, rather than one of three sisters, who does not often live in a cave. It's to say that she can turn you to stone, even though there's no example in extant literature from either Greece or Rome in which she living turns anyone into stone. There are lots of examples of her having been killed, being used to turn people to stone. But I think we can all agree that that's not the same thing at all. So originally, she's a protective goddess, or mortal sister of goddesses, technically. There are three Gorgons, Hesiod tells us. Two of them are immortal, Steno and Uriali. One of them is mortal, Medusa. And then, because when I start a novel about someone, I really like to have a lot of information to go on, he dismisses it with, and that's a wretched fate. Yeah. Great, I'll start writing, shall I, Hesiod? Thanks very much. So, Originally, these Gorgonea, these Gorgon heads, are extremely strange and animalistic. They have, as I say, the snakes for hair. They have, from a distance, of course, that looks also like a lion's mane. They have very wide mouths. Um, the word Medusa in ancient Greek means guardian, protector. The word Gorgon is harder to derive. For some people, the most plausible argument, although nothing is concrete, as is so often the way with this sort of thing, the most plausible argument is that there's a connection with thunder, something else from the wild world. If you've ever been in Greece for a storm, you'll know what I say when I say, you really understand why the king of their gods was responsible for thunder and lightning. Holy crap, it's so much more weather there. Right? They have these very wide mouths, these gorgon heads, and usually a lolling tongue, a protruding tongue, so you can tell they're making a loud noise, like the thunder. And that's why there's the suggestion that the word gorgo might come from a uh, connection to thunder. Um, it's an interesting point that Gorgons, particularly Uriali, sister to Medusa, are considered monstrous because they make a loud noise and they're female. Here's the thing in Greek, the word for the noise that Uriali makes um, is neutral, eriklantan, um, deafening, loud, and a goon. A goon is like a, a wordless cry, a howl. And so if you look at translations of these texts, what you'll often see is pejorative language has come in. A baleful dirge, the Oxford World's Classics has. It's like, what does that even really mean? Let's look at what happens when a male character makes a loud noise in Greek myth. Diomedes in the Iliad is routinely described as Diomedes of the loud war cry. In one translation that I own somewhere in my flat, Diomedes, master of the war cry. 
Do you know what it is in Greek? Diomedes, good at shouting. <laughs> Do you see what's happened here? <laughs> is that men making a loud noise is heroic and women making a loud noise is monstrous and I at least have a problem with that. So snakes for hair, similarity to a lion's mane. The earlier you go, the more likely they are to have tusks like a wild boar. These are all things that people were rightly alarmed by. The wild world, the natural world, is a scary place in Bronze Age myth. And so I think it's important that we at least consider that there might be an element of that going on when these creatures are created. Wild boar are dangerous, if you don't believe me. Ask Adonis, who you were hearing about only moments ago. You can't, of course. He dies, spoiler, having been gored by a boar. Or, you know, you could ask Odysseus, who um, is identified by his old nurse Eurycleia when he returns to Ithaca um, after his extensive visits elsewhere in the Odyssey. Um, let's all just remind ourselves, as I like to at this point, that of his 10-year Odyssey getting home, fully eight of those years are spent horizontal. Um, still having adventures, mainly the horizontal kind. Um, but he is gored by a boar in his youth when Eurycleia is given the task of washing his feet in the Odyssey. Um, she comes across the scar by which she identifies him on his inner thigh. Let's just gloss over that foot wash and quite how high it's gone. Um, because I feel like it's distracting us in an unhelpful way. Gorgons were once our guardians and our protectors, and that is why you see them in these liminal settings on the um, edges of buildings next to doors. They protect the people inside and they scare away the people outside. You paint them on your shield because you want to scare the enemy in battle, but also because you want your shield to protect you. That's literally its job, right? And one last example before I thank everybody and make you go downstairs and buy their books, since there is a bookseller down here and you love books because, duh. Um, there's one story about Medusa in Greek myth that I think is largely forgotten, and I wish it weren't, and it is this. When she is killed, the goddess Athene takes two drops of her blood, one from the left-hand side of her body, one from the right-hand side. When the god Asclepius, the god of healing and medicine, is learning those healing skills, Athene gives him a drop of blood from each side of her body. The drop from the left-hand side is fatal poison, and it can kill you in a heartbeat if your heart should beat the drop from the right-hand side of her body. The Greek word is soterian, savior. It can revive you from the dead. So please let's stop monstering women just because they're having a bad hair day. It's unacceptable to me.